Any questions before I move on to the theory part of Lama 2? Yeah, so this earlier part was just to show like Lama 2 actually can do quite well. And this is a viable system to use. All right, so this is something that maybe before I move on to the theory, this is actually something that uh, Lama 2 does that earlier models did not do. Earlier models like OpenAI, but all this, they didn't do this. This is quite new. This is called ghost attention, all right? So what is ghost attention? So they realized that once they train multi-turn conversations, that the model kind of forgot the system prompt after a while. Like for example, if the system prompt is to output everything in emojis, maybe by the fifth or sixth turn, they will stop. The model will stop outputting emojis for some reason. And it means that the attention mechanism, let's say if this is your prompt itself, it act as Oscar Wow. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see this. Act as Oscar Wow. What we want to do is we want it to be as wide as possible so that all the remainder of the all the remainder of the tokens attend to it. So you want this part here to be as bright as possible. But what you can see is that without doing this ghost attention here, somehow the Lama model, only the earlier part attends to the system prompt. The, the back part is kind of forgotten. But what they did, they did this ghost attention and then you can see that overall it's like more brightly lit. And you can see that even the last few here, message is, what is your name? My name is Oscar Wong. So this part is attending to it. So this is what, um. Lam uh, Meta says uh, quite an important breakthrough. Uh, honestly, I have my doubts, okay, because ghost attention, what they actually did, what is, what is ghost attention? The ghost attention here is basically you have to append the system prompt before all the user messages of a conversation. So like imagine what you saw earlier here. Every single user prompt here, we have a system message. And for user message too, we append a system message as well. So can you see that if your system message is very long, can you see what's going to happen? <laughs> it's going to, I mean, it's only 4,096 tokens. If you were to do this, okay, one good thing is that uh, because of the way attention works, later I'll cover on how the rotary position encoding works. It attends to the nearby tokens more than it attends to the far away ones. That's also why like this part here doesn't attend to here that easily. Okay, and this is something there is a problem. I mean, for multiple turns, you don't want it, forget the system problem. So they, the way they solved it, they solved it, I put in brackets, okay, because uh, in quotation marks, because I don't think it really solves the problem. It's more like uh, a hack, all right? The thing is, this shows that Lama 2 attention mechanism doesn't do long-term attention that easily. I mean, as compared to maybe OpenAI's one, all right? And you need to resort to this kind of tactics, all right? You need to repeat the system problem before every single user problem. Again, then they also like during training, they set the loss for zero for all tokens from previous turns. And uh, this is my opinion is so that the model is not penalized for predicting or not predicting the system prompt. Because like, you know, in a multi-turn thing, you don't keep outputting the system prompt. Okay, that's not what you're meant to do. You're meant to reply to the user. So they set all the loss to zero to prevent the contamination of the output data. So, so that, you know, when you talk to the user, you don't output the system prompt, which is kind of weird, right? <laughs> so this helps the model output maintain attention to the system problem, but it comes at the cost of increased context. So I feel like this is just a, a bypass to a more fundamental issue of Lama 2, which is that they don't do attention over long token lengths that well. All right. In fact, this might be the case for OpenAI models also, but it's very pronounced in Meta's model because they are training it for chat purposes and they have noticed this trend. And so this goes attention was I believe used as a way to try to mitigate this problem. Okay, but the more fundamental issue applies, which is like, why is there such a lack of attention across longer tokens? All right. So this is something, if you're interested, let's, uh, so I will spend the next half an hour or so talking about the details of uh, Lama, and I will cover about what, why I think the attention mechanism is not working too well here for Lama too. All right, so it probably can work quite well for small contexts, context lengths, but for long context, it probably can't do that well. Okay. I mean, I don't really notice this issue happening in OpenAI. So this is probably a way the position embeddings are done in, in Lama or in Lama 2. All right, but before we move on to the detailed analysis of Lama 2, let's talk about performance. Okay, like why must you use Lama 2, right? So I'm not gonna spend too much time here because you know you can see for yourself that across most benchmarks like code, common sense reasoning, 
world knowledge, reading comprehension, math, MMLU, BBH. Uh, all these are like different kind of benchmarks to test understanding of a language model across various domains. And you can see Lama performs the best. Okay, but best is subjective, you see. It performs the best out of open source models. So you can see our dear MPTs here, previously, um, and Falcon is here. All these are being heralded as one of the best few open source models just a few months back. All right, you can see that Lama beats it quite significantly. So if you are looking for open source model, look no further. Lama 2 is the best. All right, but as you can see in my personal evaluation just now, it doesn't do too well in code. Neither does it do too well in math. And you can see that it, it reflects here. You look here, out of 100, right? It kind of like failed here, you see. <laughs> so, so you can see that this two, indeed, um, the experiments I conducted concurs with the benchmarks over here. It doesn't do too well in this two, but it does quite well in like English comprehension and everything else. So how does it look like on the Hugging Face Leaderboard? So Hugging Face Leaderboard is another way to evaluate uh, models. And out of all the open source large language models, you can see that the leaderboard score, which is like an average across multiple data sets, LAMA2 is the best. So again, this external validation shows that in terms of open source models, LAMA2 is still the best right now. I mean, it is the best right now. Yeah. So it, it also shows that it's quite a safe model. If you look at the violation as ranked by humans to judge whether the model has output something that's unsafe, it is actually quite safe compared to like other open source models. Oh, look at this, Vikuna. <laughs> so um, yeah, ChatGPT is quite close actually. ChatGPT is not extensively tuned like Lama 2, but the violations are also quite little. So it's comparable to ChatGPT in terms of the safety of the model. Okay. So it's not bad. It's a safe model. It's really high performance. Okay. How does it... Oh, did I put the... Oh, I'm missing one slide. Okay, I do have one slide that talks about like how it performs with respect to closed source models. And in terms of closed source models, Lama 2 is comparable with like PAM, the Pathways Language Model by Google, as well as, I can't remember the other model, but it's comparable with that, but it loses, GP, it loses behind to GPT-4 by quite a huge margin. So in terms of closed source models, if you are looking for the most competent model, GPT-4 is still the best. Okay, not sure where the slide went to. I have a slide comparing to closed source models as well. Okay, so what is the difference between Lama 1 and Lama 2? Okay, one thing is they increase the amount of free training. So they train on 40% more data than Lama 1. And that is because they train on the toxic data as well. Later, I'll show you the graph. All right. <laughs> and then they rely on the RHF to, to prune the toxic data. So they say that training on toxic data helps to increase generalizability because like, you give it more kinds of... Uh, input diversity, which is a fair point. Context length is also improved, double the context length of Lama. All right, and then they have a huge supervised fine tuning portion. Okay, 100,000 uh, prompts of which they only use 20,000 plus in the end. Um, and they have, look at this, 1 million RLHF for safety, for the harm, harm, harmlessness and for harmfulness and help, helpfulness. They have 1 million annotators to comment on the outputs. Okay, so. With these numbers, it shows to me that uh, Meta is very concerned about safety and the harmfulness of the model. Because, you know, recently um, people have been slamming OpenAI saying that, hey, your model is like, uh, it's, it's not good, it outputs harmful stuff. So I think as a big corporation, Meta is very concerned about its image. They spend a lot of effort. You can see from this graph here, it spends a lot of effort making the model safe. So... As you can see from what we have experimented earlier, I think it's very hard to break that firewall because it has been tuned extensively using RHF. Okay, good and bad, okay? I mean, it's good it, if you are making a generic application that um, the outputs will generally be quite safe. It's bad if you want to do applications like summary because it, it, it may not be bad. Uh, it, it, it may not be processed. So what's the difference between Lama 2 and Lama 1? Um, in, in general, the architecture is about the same. It uses the transformer architecture, uh, generic transformer architecture. Um, the difference is that they have a lot more data cleaning. Okay, For the supervised fine-tuning step, they clean the data very extensively. They only make sure good data is there. All right? They change a bit of the data mixes. I'm not going to go through this okay, because they, didn't also, they also didn't release their mixes. All right? The 40% more tokens 
Okay, this is also because they train on the harmful stuff as well. <laughs> so that, that's the pre-training data. Double the context length. Okay, then they use this thing called the group query attention. So what is group query attention? So the group query attention here is basically like, you know, whenever you do attention, you have Q, K, and V for each of the multi-heads for like, for example, you have this layer, you go into multi-head one, you go into multi-head two, you go into multi-head three. Typically, when you do multi-header attention, you have different QKVs uh, based on like your linear kind of projection from the layer. So this group query attention means that instead of doing all this, okay, our K and V will be shared. So if I understand it correctly, this K and values, this K and values here would be shared across all your attention heads. So in so doing, you compute less and then you can store less things in memory because you can just reuse the same parameters across all the attention heads. Okay, how good is this? I don't know. I mean, they showed that it didn't really um, um, affect performance, but can actually reduce the size of the inference, right? Because you don't have to store that many parameters. So this is group query attention, right? So the other thing that I like to highlight, um, this group query attention is new, okay? But the other thing I'd like to highlight is this rotary positional embeddings. And this is not new. This rotary positional embeddings have already been used for Llama 1, all right? And what is rope, okay? So before we go into rope, I need to give you some background, all right? So imagine you have some words like, for example, I am a student, all right? I like to use this, I am a student, yeah? Because yeah, this is the most common example. So you do have, let's say each of these words, okay, is a token, okay? Let's just assume that each of them is a token. Of course, sometimes it might be subwords and so on. So these are your word embeddings or your token embeddings. Okay, typically what we will do next is we will put in positional embeddings. Okay, for those of you who have, who have been here before, anyone want to tell me why? Why do we need positional embeddings? A anyone? Why well, draw the positional embedding box? Anyone want to like comment on why we need positional embeddings? Because all the tokens are uh, processed at the same time. Yeah, actually, it's meant to um, make sure that the sequence matters. Like, for example, like I hit uh, A hit B versus B hit A. You know, the, there's a difference in sequence. The meaning is different. So for transformer architecture, there's no um, inherent sequence there because you pay attention to everything. So you need to incorporate your sequence information somewhere. And uh, that is in the form of positional embeddings. All right, so the traditional way of doing positional embeddings is that you take the token embeddings, okay, you take the position embeddings and you sum them up. Okay, then after that, this, things, this thing then will go inside your transformer architecture like that. Okay, I realize I should have put a graph of the transformer here. <laughs> but the idea is that once we sum up these positional embeddings, okay, you do have some information of the positions. And the position embeddings are like for even terms, you use a sine, and for odd terms, you use a cosine. And uh, over here, this K is like the uh, position on, of, of the word itself. So this is the dimension, the hidden dimension. And, and sorry, T is the, T is the, um, basically the, the position of the word. Yeah, K, is, K and D are like your, your hyperparameters for, so K, K is for the dimension, sorry. K is for the dimensions for the token and T is for your position of the word. So um, that's, that's a way to, and embody like the positional information using the sine and cosine wave. And by doing like a cosine similarity between the positional embeddings, you realize that similar positions have a higher cosine similarity, which means that you pay attention more to nearby tokens. Okay, that's the idea of positional embeddings is so that you pay attention to nearby tokens. Okay, recently this rope paper, they said that using rotational positional embeddings Okay, instead of adding the positional embeddings, we take the embedding space here, we multiply okay, by a certain angle. So like, for example, this was your original embedding. Then you multiply by an angle here to a new embedding space here. So instead of doing a plus, you do a multiplication. So they showed that this was like slightly better on some data sets. Okay, but I have a problem with this rot rotary positional embeddings. Okay, the problem is this. All right, you see in your high dimensional space, each vector represents a semantic meaning. So you have one meaning here, one meaning there, like multiple meanings here. 
And if you were to rotate by a certain angle, and this angle is like larger the grid, I mean, the, the angle will change based on position. And like the further the position, the, the, the higher the angle. So the thing is similar, like words like this again, will have a, a smaller angle between them because this theta here is smaller for, between words of like, uh, within nearby, nearby tokens. The thing is, if you were to do something like that, if your theta is large enough, right? If this is your original embedding, what will happen is when you multiply like that, you might actually go very, very close to another word here. So it might mix up. I don't know how much of your positional embeddings will get mixed up with the original word embeddings. Because if you do a rotation like that, like you can easily rotate into the direction of another word. So this is something that I don't quite like about rotary positional embeddings. I mean, we do this additional base method. Um, no matter like what you do for this, at least the token embeddings will still be preserved because like when you do back propagation and your input is A plus B, you can back propagate to A and back propagate to B. You know, you, you can do for both of them. But if you do something like A times B, um, I've done experiments before. If you do back propagation on a multiplication term, right? The gradients don't work out too well. And you know, when you do this kind of rotation to embody the the, the token position, this kind of influences the semantic meaning as well. At least when you do addition, it, do, it doesn't influence that much. Okay, because I mean, we have shown also in some of my previous videos, I showed that like for vision transformers, you can take away the position and embeddings and the and the um, the accuracy doesn't really change too much. Okay, that was shown in Swin transformers. Okay, but if you do this thing here, I think it will affect the output a lot. Okay, this good and bad thing. But the thing is this, how are you so sure that this, this angle rotation won't change the vector such that it reaches another vector that is of a different meaning. Like how can we disentangle between the uh, meaning of the token versus meaning of the position? Yeah. So this is something that I think is a problem with Lama. I don't know why they use rotary positional embeddings, but just now you saw earlier, we, did, we needed the goal's attention to like help to improve context length, right? It could be very well that because of this rotational positional embeddings, the tokens for very, very far away positions cannot attend to each other anymore. Okay, because like if let's say from the start to the end, the difference is this much, okay, it's not similar anymore. So even though the word might be the same, like you are Oscar Walt. And then at the end, it's like, what is your name? So by right, the name is supposed to attend to this thing here, right? But because you put rotary positional embeddings and the context length is so long before you reach what's your name, the angle difference here, this angle difference is larger if there are more tokens in between them. Okay, so... So if you have this rotary position embeddings, you can imagine that the longer the context, the longer this, the larger this rotation, and then you may not attend to it as well. Because um, the idea of this kind of position embeddings is like you only attend to the nearby context. But this rotation makes it like such that it's like almost impossible to attend to the top anymore. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the get chart, all right? Look at the get chart. You can see that the tokens only attend to this area well which means it only attends to like left and right, the neighbors. It doesn't really attend very far away. Like the far away tokens don't really get attended to very well. And you can see that the system prompt don't really get at attended to not much compared to like here. Yeah, I'm not sure how this would perform on the normal position embeddings when you add them up, but my gut feel tells me that this rotary positional embeddings might be the cause of some issues of this uh, that require goes attention to solve. Okay, because I, I've experimented with this multi-turn uh, chat system in my games. And on the OpenAI chat GPT, not, not a big problem. There's, there's no issue with like me needing to repeat the system problem that much. All right. So I think this might be a, a positional embedding thing. So you don't quote me on this because I have not done the research on this. But my, my field tells me that this rotary positional embeddings is not correct. 
Okay, so I'm sorry to the authors of this, but I don't quite agree with, with whatever they propose in this. Uh, but Meta agrees with it. So Lama 1 and Lama 2 both use rotary positional embeddings. Uh, if you want to extend your context length, you have to use rotary positional embeddings to extend it as well. Yeah, so yeah. any questions on this? Okay, I do realize I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to like spend another 15 to 20 minutes. So I'll overshoot a little bit, if you all don't mind, to cover the rest of the training flow for Lama 2. So this is the overall training flow. Okay, I will skip this for now because we will go through section by section. Okay, uh, the, okay maybe I just cover a little bit. Like pre-training will be the usual pre-training on the entire web's worth of data. Fine-tuning, supervised fine-tuning is to fine-tune to a select set of good data. All right, so that the model is performance. Okay, so the first part, the pre-training is meant to find out structure of text. The second part is meant to give you more or less correct outputs with the supervised fine-tuning. And then we have this human feedback, which is mainly to gather data for harmlessness and helpfulness. So we want the, the model to be as safe and as helpful as possible. Then we perform this reinforcement learning step to make the model more safe and more helpful. That's, that's about it. All right, so first, pre-training. So I just want to highlight that in the pre-training data, there are some stuff that uh, for toxicity score, like of 0 0.5 and higher, is about 0.2% of the documents, which means there are some documents that they use that are toxic content. So toxic content could be like violence. It could be something like sexual content, which sometimes, most of the time people will take them out from the pre-training. But Meta puts them in, and I believe it might be a good move because it means that it can incorporate structure of more variety of text, right? But you need to take great pains to make sure that you don't output this toxic content later on. So this is one thing to take note of if you are using Lama 2, is train on toxic content as well. They didn't filter at all. All right, so uh, this is something that I think we need to marvel at this. All right, if you look at the paper, they actually have a cluster of like, 2048 um, A100 GPUs. All right, let's give a round of applause for Meta. 2000 A100 GPUs. I'm very sure that um, only them, them can procure that many. And look at the number of hours they spend. 1720320 GPU hours. I don't think I live that long. Yeah, so this is the amount of pollution that goes into our world. You look at this, the carbon emitted. Yeah, but we have to thank them for releasing Lama 2 because this means that we don't have to do this GPU training. Yeah, we, we, we will never be able to afford that many GPUs and that many hours. All right. So whatever you have on Lama 2, even for chat GPT as well, is the fruits of labor of many, many hours of training and many, many billions of dollars. All right. So uh, one thing to highlight is that they actually stopped training after 2,000 billion passes of the tokens. Again, okay, given that the entire set is basically on the, so, so they train on 2 trillion tokens. And you saw earlier the amount of coppers that they have. They have, oh sorry, 2 trillion tokens, yeah. So they basically train on the uh, coppers many, many times until they process 2 trillion tokens. And they realize that the model loss is still going down. Okay, it means that we perhaps could train for even longer and get better performance because it's been shown for large language models that overtraining helps. Like you train beyond, like even your training loss plateaus, you can still improve performance on the validation set. Uh, yes, Sharon, please go ahead. Sorry, very briefly, TTO is what? Huh? Perplexity, I believe. Perplexity. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, another question. Uh, so these uh, tokens, I'm not referring to the like must be distinct tokens, right? Or it can be like just, we are just talking about a number of steps. So you can train again with the-, yeah. the So, so I, I'm not sure how many tokens that, let's say their entire pre-training corpus, let's say their pre-training corpus is uh, 1, billion, 1 billion tokens. I'm not sure how many is this, but if you train 2,000 billion, means you train it 2,000 times, 2,000 epochs. Yeah, so they just keep- uh, my, my concern is, for example, if you just keep increasing the data size, the copper size, wouldn't that cause some other problem? Maybe at some point, they just start to forget the, the, the data only seen once at the very beginning, if it's not like used again. Mm, I mean, the data will keep repeating, right? So you will see the tokens again. Okay. Yeah. So um, this one, 
honestly, what, what this graph is meant to show is that you can probably still train someone and improve the performance. All right. So yeah, if I'm not wrong, this is perplexity loss. Let me check again with the paper and, and uh, update if I'm wrong. All right. <laughs> so this basically compares to see whether or not like the output matches the kind of semantic meaning as the input. Yeah. I mean, you could also use like maximum likelihood loss for the next token prediction as well. So yeah, this is just one metric that we can use. All right. So Ah, this is the one. Okay, this closed source one is over here. So I wanted to highlight earlier that um, Lama 2 is comparable to Palm, is comparable to ChatGPT in terms of scores, but it loses Palm 2L, it loses GPT-4. So if you want a high performance model, you should still use GPT-4 or Palm 2. I mean, Palm 2 is not open, uh, it's not usable unless you're in Google. So you should use GPT-4. Okay, next step, supervised fine tuning. So this is something I want to highlight. I really like this step of, of Meta. Uh, I think they did this step really well. Okay, so firstly, they did some public instruction tuning data from using the same data set that Plan T5 uses. There's a bunch of corpus um, that are like selected because they are known to be good. All right, so these are used for supervised fine tuning. But later on, they use this thing called fewer but higher quality examples. So they actually ask people to label data, right? To label what's a good output. And so they have 27,540 annotated labels and they just do the supervised fine tuning on those labels. So like Meta has found out that instead of doing broad fine tuning, we have very targeted fine tuning, but very high quality data. And this can outperform even more data. So quality is greater than quantity. And if you are interested, you can read this paper. Less is more for alignment. I, I like this paper a lot because it showed that RLHF is not needed and it can perform very well already. So I'm very happy that um, we, we have found this out because it means that for people who don't have much compute power, we have hope. All you need is very good quality data across a various range of distributions. Hopefully it covers the test distribution. You can actually get quite good training results for supervised fine tuning as well. Okay, yeah. so, so why do you think, if that's the case, right, why do you think they still use RHF? I will cover that later. I have my own, um, as you know me, I don't like RHF. I will give my remarks on that later, all right? We, we save the best for the last, all right? So I have a comment. Uh, Chun Feng, you said that similar to textbooks are all you need. Uh, yes, that's correct. So Pi1 textbooks are all you need has shown that if you fine tune on very specialized data that are high quality. Like Phi one does on like textbooks for coding. Textbooks are all you need. I believe they did it on textbooks in general. And um, this shows that if you just train on this very small but high quality data, you can get very good results for that domain. All right. So supervised fine tuning, they use this method. And I mean, the paper, they say that they did that so they can focus more on RLHF. All right. <laughs> so the, the question that I have for Meta is like, Where's uh the the results for SFT models? Because like they never gave any results in the paper, like just SFT only without RHF. They never gave the results for those. All right. At least for the GPT-4 technical report, they got showed they showed that SFT models um perform better at some domains and worse at some other domains after RHF. But for the Lama 2 paper, we didn't get to see that kind of results. I suspect that supervised fine tuning will be good enough. This is my suspicion, but they don't want to release the SFT model. Why? Okay, you have to go back to the pre training step. See, they train on the toxic data, I see. So if they release the SFT, you're going to have a lot of hate speech coming out from the model. So because of the way they pre train, they need to make sure that the output is safe. Okay, where, where am I? Yeah, here. Yeah. So uh, if you are training your own SFT, I recommend using this same constraints that they use. These are the SFT parameters that Meta use, right? In the future, I will probably come up with a video of how to do SFT because I'm very interested to do SFT myself on Lama 2 as well. So we will see uh, what the open source community has to say about this SFT because this is very important for a lot of use cases when you can fine tune on your own data. So uh, let me just share with you another paper. So this paper is called, uh, a prompt is worth a thousand examples. So if you can fine tune Okay, on a thousand examples, you can omit the prompt itself. I mean, I, I'm just uh, loosely speaking, translating what the paper has like, sort of discovered. So 
if you see, we have limitations of context length. And every time you have longer context, you take longer for inference. So if you can reduce the context length by doing this kind of fine tuning, all right, then I think that will be viable, especially if we are using that model for a long time. All right, so one way is prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is you don't need to fine tune, okay, but you need longer context. If you do fine tuning, you uh, shorter prompts. But you need more examples. So, so if you are using this for a very, very specialized purpose, I think fine tuning is the way to go. Okay, especially now that if you own Lama 2 model, you don't have to worry that you know OpenAI suddenly depreciates the model and then you have to fine tune again. All right, you can use that model forever. All right, so that's the benefit of an open source model. Sorry, I think I have two points we'd like to clarify here. Okay. First is, uh, I I don't think what SFT this uh, like as uh, doing SFT with high quality data here. What it does is exactly the same as uh, what the Phi one does. Uh, we, we, is I, I mean the the textbook I don't need paper because in that case right they are doing these different things. One is semi supervised learning, basically um that's do the next token prediction right. But here it's not exactly the next token prediction. It's like you have the the expert demonstration of the what kind of um a response you you would like to have right. So so I I. Yeah, I, I would like, I tend to think of them as a bit different things. A second point is uh, regarding the, 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 the fact that RLHF can uh, reduce the model capability. They also depends on the, the objective of your RLHF. So I think uh, in, in the case of GT4, they actually use RLHF to do a uh, safeguard, right? So in that case, they um purposely to re reduce the like I, I, because uh, usually if you want to increase the safety um it is at the expense of the reducing the model capabilities but but actually if you look at the constitutional ai paper this actually you can do the model capability and uh, the safety separately which means if you my guess is if you use rhf just for the model capability is it doesn't necessarily reduce the model capability. Yeah. Okay, so you are saying that RHF won't reduce the capability. Is, is that your main point? It really depends on your objective with RHF. Yeah, okay, perhaps. Yeah, so we will look at the RHF results later and we can comment on that. Yeah, so thanks for your, your sharing. So I actually quite agree with the points that you made as well, Um, except maybe the RHF part, all right. So now let's talk about the RHF part, all right. So human feedback. So what is this human feedback thing? So they firstly train the reward model. So this is the same as uh, ChatGPT. So the annotators will write a prompt. The model will sample two results. Okay. And then these results will be as varied as possible. And they will rate which one they prefer. Okay. And they rate which one is prefer in terms of safety and helpfulness. So it's harmlessness and helpfulness. They will rate which one is better. And over time, uh, they have a million binary comparisons. And this million is not done one shot, it's done iteratively. So I believe they have seven versions of the RHF model. They train one model, they did this reward model based on the new model, they get the feedback. They use that feedback to train a reward model. The reward model trains the whatever PPL algorithm, trains the language model again. Then we generate more like comparisons based on the new language model. So it's like a, an iterative cycle. So the new language model will give you the outputs and then the person will choose which one is better. This will then go back into the model itself using PPO, the proximal policy optimization, and then we'll train the model again. So this is quite um, interesting because this is something new. They did the RRHS step iteratively so that I believe this is a good thing because that means they can con continuously improve on the existing version of the model. So it's like, you know, when you do alpha, uh, not alpha, um, alpha go, yeah, alpha go, you have a teacher and student model. The student keeps learning from the teacher. Then after a while, the teacher becomes, uh, the student becomes the teacher, and then uh, you try to beat the teacher again. And yeah, this is something like an iterative progressive step. Yeah, I like this a lot. So this is at least something that um, I like about the RHF. Um, they have two rewards. One is helpfulness to see how helpful the model is. So it's to help to fulfill the request. And then the second one is about safety or harmlessness. 
to make sure that the re re responses are safe. And uh, this safety is actually quite important given that they use toxic data for the pre-training. So better make sure that you filter it out, right? If not, you, your users are gonna get toxic data as outputs. So what is the reward modeling uh, equation? So the reward model is actually quite simple. We basically want your preferred choice have a higher reward. So let's say if you like this output, so it's like output A is better. You want the output to be like five, three points and output B is worse. You want this to rank as like maybe one point. Yeah, so you want to incentivize the reward. You want to make the reward model output a higher score for something that you like better. So there are two kinds of rewards that they have here. One is the helpfulness reward, and one is the safety reward or the harmlessness reward. And over here, let me just briefly explain how this works. So you know the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function looks like this. So this is the sigmoid function. Okay, this is like x, and maybe this is sigmoid x. The sigmoid function looks like this. Is zero, and this is one. Okay. So, what is the log function? So the log function looks like this. So, this is the one. So this is like x, and this is log x. So what you can see is that in order for this log function, okay, to give you, uh, because this is your loss, you see. So your loss over here, what we want is we want the loss to be zero as much as possible because if we have a loss that is a high value, okay, it means that we will have to correct the model. So when will the loss be at zero? Is when x is at one. So you can see over here. And when will x be at one? Is when this part is here. So what, what is this x? this x? This x is exactly this term here. So let me give you a layman summary of this, what I just described. In order for low loss, okay, the difference must be high. All right, and what's this difference? This difference is the difference of the reward model score for yc minus the reward model score for YR. So for example, this is YC, output A is YC, and output B is YR. What we want this, what we want to happen is we want the reward for the response that we think is better to overwhelm the smaller one so much that it saturates it, okay, saturates, saturates the sigmoid function, and then you get zero loss. Okay, because any less, okay, let me just show you, any less, is, let's say it's over here, like 0 0.5. Any less in terms of the sigmoid function, we're going to get 0 0.5 here. We're going to get a negative value here, which means that your loss is going to be positive. So this means that we must have the difference between the better output minus the not so good output. We want it to be very good. And in the original RHF, there's, there's no such thing as margin here. So we just want it to be better than the other response. Okay, but what they realized, and I think this is quite smart. Okay, this came from, I believe, Ian LeCun's uh, stuff on um, contrastive learning. All right. So what they want is that, for example, you have two points here. This is the good response. And like this is the bad response. Okay, we kind of want this good and bad response to be greater than a certain margin. Let's call this M. All right. So we want it such that like, you would want the loss to be zero if the margin is greater than M, but you want a positive loss if the margin is less than M. So by doing this, this is something like a hinge loss. Okay, I'm just going to write this word here. You can go ahead and search it. So if, let's say, your margin between the rewards is higher than a certain number M, okay, we don't penalize the model at all. But if it's smaller than this certain number M, so let's say if this M here is two, all right, and then your reward here is like three, and then this reward here is one. So you see, three and one is two, just nice, it's within the margin two. So this whole thing here will become zero. So sigmoid of zero is zero, and then log zero is one. So the whole thing will be minus one. Uh, log zero is one, and the loss here will be 
Okay, log zero is, sorry, there's no log zero. Log, okay, let me think about it. If this sigmoid here is zero, okay, sigmoid zero will give me, okay, let me think about it. Sigmoid zero, <laughs> sigmoid zero will give me zero, then the log here will be a negative, a very, very high negative term. That's not good, isn't it? Yeah, so this margin actually kind of like uh, make sure that the minimum difference between um, the positive and the negative term or, or the, the good and the worst term, we want to make sure that it's beyond this number. We want to make sure that this thing here is much, much greater than this beyond a certain number. So this margin here is meant to help to push away the reward term so that um, the better reward gets a higher score and the worst rewards get a lower score. And the main thing is this MR, okay, will be based off this thing called the preference rating. So in addition to giving a binary output of good or bad, the raters will say that, okay, how much more good is it? Is it weakly preferred, strongly preferred? And based on this strong or weak, they will come out of this margin here. So for responses that are like super distinct, distinctly far away, you give a higher margin. You want the reward model to push the distinct results far away from each other. And for results that are like only slightly better than each other, you don't want, you don't want to overkill. You don't want like response A to be like three and response B to be one. Okay, you want it to be like three and two maybe, or three and 2.5. You don't want to make the re uh, reward too far apart. So you put this margin term there. So this kind of makes sure that like the rewards don't get pushed away too far away. So I think this is quite a, an interesting innovation. And if you look at the diagrams in the paper, actually the reward modeling does look good. It makes the safety and the helpfulness reward all skewed towards the intended one, which is a high score. So I think overall the RHF process um, has been successful for Meta. Right? They have made the thing output a better, a more helpful response and a less harmful response. Sorry, so, I have one question here. Yep. So, if, so they still use the pairwise laws, right? Yes, it's a pairwise loss. The pairwise loss. The question is, if you already have the pairwise loss and you have the preference, at least you have the correct ordering for every pair of all your responses, right? Then what's the point of having that margin? You got I mean, for example, it have A better than B. A is preferred to B. B is preferred to C. Then of course I have A is preferred to C. But of course it implies the magnitude of A prefers to C is larger than A prefers to B, right? So I, I, I thought a model can or like intrinsically can already learn it result. Like explicitly we specify this margin here. Mm. No, because if you don't specify the margin, what will happen is that your, your loss will incentivize pushing away the positive and negative as far as possible. So isn't that good? Uh, not exactly. If both responses are about the same in terms of helpfulness or, or, harm, or harmfulness, you uh, don't want the I see, to be too far away. I see. But relatively speaking, um, like the example I just gave, right? It's still, uh, uh, even without this margin, the model can still learn A, the magnitude of A preferred to C is, is larger than A preferred to B, right? But I do acknowledge the issue you mentioned. So, Result of this explicitly stating this, maybe A prefer to B is not that huge of a difference, but maybe the model will think it's very huge. Okay, yeah. I think it does. Well, anyway, just, uh, I just thought about it because it's not I, when I did the sigmoid, something was off. I think a sigmoid doesn't go negative. A sigmoid is like that at 0 0.5, if I remember correctly. So yeah, e to the power of x plus e to the power of minus x over 2. Yeah, so this should be the sigmoid x. Which means that if let's say both of them hit the zero mark, which is like this whole thing is zero, is at the margin itself, then the loss, the loss will be negative log. Yeah, which is about um yeah, the loss will be log two. So it's like a flat value. So it's it's not that big. Yeah. So in in essence, if you make the reward difference greater than the margin. You just need this thing to be greater than the other one. Beyond the margin, your loss won't be that huge. So that's the whole idea behind this reward modeling equation. Okay. So just to clarify that, because just now the graph look a bit wrong to me. Right? <laughs> you can't have a log negative number. All right. So yeah. So all this RHF right makes me wonder. Right? Can we just use a constitution for 
the harmlessness and the helpfulness. Okay? You know, human annotators can make mistakes sometimes, right? Like, why can't we just like take a constitution that is drafted by, by people, all right? So over here, this, rest, uh, this critique over here is actually based on a constitution. So we come up with a constitution by saying well, what is acceptable, what is not, and use this to revise the model's outputs. So this one is a harmless response by the model. Then you can train this harmless response with respect to the prompts. Okay, you can take this, this uh, prompt with the prompt is here. So this is the prompt and this is the initial response. You take the prompt and you take the harmless response and you fine tune it here. Using the constitution, you can actually train the model using fine tuning okay, to output less harmful stuff and more helpful stuff. So this is something that could be done, okay, just using the fine tuning step alone, okay, without doing this RL part. Okay, so this RL AIF, RL with um, AI feedback, I think this part is also not, not necessary. Why can't we just use supervised fine tuning using the constitution and omit RLHF? Okay, you all must be thinking like, why am I so against RLHF? Um, because I feel like um, based on my four years using, doing reinforcement learning, uh, reinforcement learning doesn't really generalize too well to out of distribution conditions. And you know, when you talk about helpful and harmful, uh, yes, if you have enough like prompts to cover the entire distribution of uh, possible input prompts, perhaps RL can work quite well. Um, but as you know, RL, I mean, as you know, like language is so diverse, like you can never be, you can never create anything that is like within distribution of your test distributions. Like there will always be out of distribution samples. Uh, like earlier when we talked about making a bomb, like tell me how to make a bomb, I, I just basically want to summarize the sentence and they really classify it as harmful. So that is something that is out of distribution because I think very few people will ask to summarize, like tell me how to make a bomb. So if we use like this RLHF process to do it, messages like this will be flagged out as harmful. So the perils of using RLHF is that you might over extend your distribution of whatever you train in your reward model. And indeed, that's what, what I see in the case of Lama 2. All right, so let's talk about the fine tuning part with the RL, all right? There are two steps. First step is rejection sampling. So just to highlight rejection sampling, what is it? Okay, rejection sampling means I will sample seven answers. So let's say, for example, I have a prompt. I, I get response one, response two, response K. Hey. Out of this response, the reward model will give me a reward like one, three, two. Okay, what I do, okay, I don't, I don't train on everything. I only train on response two because it gives me the highest reward. Okay, so this is the reward itself. So I take this from and I take this response. Okay, and then after that, I run PPO on it. Okay, so essentially, what is this doing? Okay, this might look very weird, right? Why do we do this like sample many times and take only the best one? I like this method. Okay, let me get this. I like rejection sampling. This is great because what it means that you only learn from the most promising response. So in this case, you see, whenever you learn something, you can learn from positive examples or negative examples, right? Here, we are learning from positive examples because higher reward means it's something that we like a lot more. So essentially, we are sort of fine-tuning model on positive response because we choose the most positive one and we train the model to output that. I mean, I actually believe we can actually, I think we can also do supervised fine-tuning on this rejection sampling output. We don't need RHF. This is my view. We can do the K prompts, take the best prompt and do supervised fine-tuning on it. Okay, it's much like what you saw in the constitutional AI here. You can just take the good prompts by the constitution and fine tune on it. Here you sample K answers. I mean, you can also sample K answers in the constitution here and you can fine tune on the best answer. So this essentially is choosing, oops, sorry. This essentially is choosing the best response, the most positive response for the model to learn. So that imagine if you are this model here. Okay, you are this, this model. All right, this is your goal, all right? So this, again, is a reinforcement learning thing. You have, this is your goal. You want to step towards the goal. Okay, but you don't know how to go towards the goal. You only have this reward model to give you the signal. So if I were to give you a reward model one, maybe you can go here. If I give you a reward 
here, you maybe can go here. If I give you reward three, maybe you can go here. So in some sense, giving the highest reward, okay, it actually expedites the process of reaching the goal, which is the highest reward. Yeah, you know, it's like every time when you want to learn a new skill, right? If you have already a friend who can already do the skill, like balancing a pen on the finger, you know, it's much easier to learn from that friend who can balance already than it is to learn from multiple failed attempts. I mean, you can learn from failure as well, but it just takes longer to learn from failure. So this rejection sampling is a great idea. It's, a, it's an awesome idea. I, I believe intelligence is all about this. You have multiple threads of simulation. You choose the best outcome and then you train on those. This works very well for a lot of use cases. And in fact, in my recent paper, I also did something like that. Like you have uh, multiple outputs and you choose the best output. So like I strongly believe in this kind of mass sampling and then filtering. This approach is probably the key to intelligence. Okay, so I really like this idea. Rejection sampling. I, I hate the name of it. I, I think it should be called mass sampling and filtering. Yeah, rejection sampling sounds a bit like negative. Yeah, but the idea is to choose the best answer and then train on it so that you can reach the highest reward faster. And I believe this is the reason why the reward model works so well in Lama 2, right? maybe compared to OpenAI's uh, RHF. Okay. Again, I'm not sure, so sure of the specifics, but I believe this is very important, this rejection sampling. Okay. Um, but they showed that this method led to re regression in some capabilities. Okay. Maybe because you know the helpful data um, doesn't involve like composing rhyming lines. <laughs> Maybe people find like opposing poem not too helpful. So, you know, it can lead to some bias. As with RL methods, you were biased towards your like training distribution. And yeah, that's also one of the reasons why I don't like RHF. Uh, but I still going to cover it for completeness anyway. So um, this is proximal policy optimization. So what this does is that we treat the language model as an agent. So we have an agent, which is a language model. The agent, what the agent does is the agent is given a prompt, a prompt P. And this language model is then going to give you an output A. Okay, A is basically the action. And this action is your response. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to score this response with a, with a reward model. So we have a reward model that scores the response. Okay, and then you get a certain reward. Okay, and then what we'll do is then based on this reward, Okay, we will then back propagate this. To update the LM because the reward model is kind of frozen. So this gradient will flow through all the way back to the reward model and then, uh, sorry, to the language model. And this language model will then learn how to achieve this reward. So, I mean, this is a one step reinforcement learning thing. You know, if you think about it, kind of looks like <laughs> it kind of looks like SFP. I mean, you're just training with a, with a single uh, reward itself. So like over here, what you see in this very complicated uh, equation is that given a certain problem, we sample a, a, a response G. So maybe I put this G. Okay, we get a certain reward based on the reward model. And then we maximize the overall reward, okay, given by this policy pi. Okay, this policy is this language model pi. So essentially, PPO is actually meant to be a multi-step thing, but when applied in a single step large language model to generate a, a response, it kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like supervised uh, training, supervised learning actually. So yeah. my question to you is why then, why you still don't think uh, RL can generalize better in this case? Because this is not a typical RL setting, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's not a typical RL setting. Which means that because the typical one is much more complicated than this one. Essentially, the objective, the setting here is more like a contextual bandit as opposed to a typical MDP environment because there's no transition. This It's not episodic. It's like one step, then you go back to beginning again, but maybe with a different uh, context, right? So yeah. there's transition involved. So my understanding is typically I... I my guess is why RL suffers from generalization problem is probably a overfit to the some specific transition function. Then that transition function is very important. It's a determining factor of a certain environment. If you overfit to that transition function, then it's very hard to generalize to another environment, which has a different set of transition 
transition dynamics. But here, we, we don't have that. Yeah, you're saying that the response generally, the reward model rated similarly, right? I'm it saying here is a much simpler uh, setting where RL may not be may not suffer that severely from the problem you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you why I don't really like RL. Um, this is the reason. Although it looks like supervised fine tuning, look at what we are training with. We are training with a scalar R. Okay. This scalar will tell you like how good your response is. Okay. I'm thinking, why not just do this? Okay. Why why not just do this? You have a prompt here. Okay, again, this is a, a crucial thing to debate with RRHF. Okay, I'm actually against RRHF. But if you look over here, you can have also a language model. Okay, this is like maybe a policy right now. Okay. And then you have you have your response G, right? But then we can also have a G prime prime, which is like maybe this is from uh, rejection sampling. Or maybe this is from like uh with constitutions. So it's like you do rejection sampling with constitution, make, make sure that the output is safe and you get the like the best score per se, like in terms of the safety. But so well, maybe your reward model can go here. You can, you can go into this prompt here. And then what we will do is we will just make this prompt as close as possible to this prompt. Like so in this case, our reward signal is more than just this scalar. Our our signal is actually the stream of tokens of G prime prime. Okay, I would think the reward will be more dense here. So PPO kind of makes the reward a scalar, and that's not very ideal. Why can't we just make the reward the actual prompt we want to see itself? Because my concern here is if you, I mean, I agree that it's small reward signal, but at the same time, if you exactly just straightforward, just straightway tells it what is the expert answer, what is what does it look like exactly, right? Then there's a potential risk of overfit to that expert demonstration. So that also might cause generalization problem. That's true. But as we have seen in Lima, the less is more in alignment uh, with good quality supervised oh, yeah, yeah. fine tuning. Yeah, I, I wait for your, <laughs> every wait for your result. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not doing on this, but I believe strongly that we can omit RHF. And I, just I thought you said you practice. want to fine tune, fine tune Lama too, right? So we'll see. Yeah, I, I actually strongly believe you can fine tune and achieve yeah. better results than RHF. Also, just a, just a heads up, even for constitutional AI, they still need to start off from a RHF model. It just oh, no, is no, not... no, 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 don't, don't, don't need, don't need. You look, at the, you look at the diagram. This part is not RHF. So you I'm see saying, the... I'm, you I'm, see saying the we, I'm, I'm saying we end here. No, you, but you start from a helpful RHF model. Uh, then in that case, don't, don't do this. <laughs> Uh, I, I read a paper, they actually, I mean, if it's possible to get rid of that, they won't do that. But I mean, at least at the moment, the fact that they still start from a somewhat fine-tuned model says something, right? Yeah, what, what it shows is that... They still cannot completely get rid of our issue. Mm, Lama, um, Lama 2 in the paper also mentioned that um, a lot of their researchers are hesitant to use RL as well. Um, but because it's been shown that RL can actually give very few examples and generalize to a lot more settings. So it is like the less of two evils. So although it can overgeneralize, it kind of works. So they use RL. It kind of works for most cases. Uh, no, I think for, for the constitutional AI, the reason they start from an RL chef model is because if you start from a base model, it can't even respond properly to your request because it's just doing next word prediction. Uh, so okay. if you have a somewhat model that can do dialogue or conversation with the user, then you can, then it can start to learn feedback. I see, I, I see if that's the issue, then uh, maybe we can have human annotators to do G prime prime over here. But how does it learn to do conversation with human if you don't totally don't use um, RR share? Because, oh wait, okay, okay, I see. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just saying, I'm just thinking if they can, choose to not use it, they still use it, there must be a reason. Yeah, okay, let me explain why I think this is not a good step for PPO, okay? So look at this, okay, this is basically saying that, you know, don't RHF too much, <laughs> go back to base policy. Okay, so this is essentially what it's doing here. So, I mean, if you look at my, like, how ChatGPT works uh, discussion the last time, I also showed something similar. So you have two distributions here. 
and Q. So this is distribution P. And this is distribution Q. Essentially, when we do KL divergence between P and Q like this, D, P, Q, what we want to do is we want to shift distribution, distribution P closer to distribution Q. So you kind of want to shift this distribution to this distribution here. So in this case, we want to shift the, um, this pi theta is basically the, this pi here, which is the large language model. And this pi naught is the original policy. We want to shift the um, outputs of the language model after IRHF to be closer and closer to the original base policy, uh, which means that if you take away this term, uh, you will probably not do too well, okay? They still need to ground it on the base policy. So what does this tell you? It tells you that RHF has overgeneralized too much. So you need to grind back to the base policy, right? But if you were to do like stuff like supervised fine tuning, I don't think that's this problem. Yeah. So I anyway, mean, this is my view. Okay, this is my view, but let's talk about the paper now. The paper says, okay, do RHF. Okay, this is from the reward model itself. Okay, and then the, the on part on the right is to say that, okay, I constrain it so that I only generate like stuff that's close to my original distribution. So I, I deviate a bit, but I don't deviate too much. Okay, and over here, you will see that this reward model here is slightly different from that used by OpenAI. How different? Let's take a look at the next slide. So it's a hybrid reward function. So it combines safety and helpfulness. So actually, it's very, very simple. So it's like if your safety is here, if your safety is below this threshold of 0 0.15, okay, if my safety is 0 0.15 and below, it will be safety. Okay, then, then the rest, okay, I don't need to care. Then for the helpfulness, as long as the output is safe, okay, it's determined by 0 0.15, okay, because it's about like precision of 0 0.89 and recall 0 0.55 on the safety test set. So it's like kind of anything that is below here is unsafe. Okay, so Meta considers anything with a reward score for safety of less than 0 0.15, unsafe. So if the model is unsafe, we want to focus on making it safe. So our reward function will be the safety part. But if the function is already safe, uh, if the output is already safe, then we want to focus on helpful. So let me summarize in words for everyone, okay? If not safe, make it safe. Else make it more helpful. Okay, I mean, you might be wondering why they have two separate reward terms, right? One for safety, one for um, helpfulness, and only use only one reward function. Yeah, actually, it's because it's very, very hard to train on two separate reward functions. You train on one, you might diverge on the other one. You train on the other one, you might diverge on one. So I think it's quite a smart move to train both together. So as long as it's not unsafe, you improve on the helpfulness. So eventually, once we tackle this part here and everything is safe, okay, then we will go to the helpful part. So this is exactly what the hybrid reward function is doing. All right, and over here, you can see that this reward value, okay, they kind of want to um, change it a little bit. They do a logic term. Yeah, so it, like, instead of um, doing just the reward value itself, you actually apply the logic function, which is something like that. <laughs> yeah, and then you whiten it, which makes the covariance one. Yeah, so they did some tuning there. I believe this is just some like, hyperparameter tuning thing to make sure that like the magnitude of this kind of matches the magnitude of this. Okay, there's no mathematical basis, I believe, um, in doing the whitening and the logic part, but I believe it worked better than just using the scalar value from the reward here. Okay, so uh, this again is just some empirical stuff that I guess worked better. Uh, I still feel like this reward signal is too sparse for training, too sparse. Okay, this reminds me of what the issue I have with GANs. Okay, GANs. You all know GANs? Generative adversarial networks. The problem with GANs is that you only receive the signal from your discriminator, which is either a one or a zero. All right, and it means that if the discriminator can tell you, oh, I'm not fooled by you, or yes, I'm fooled by you, but it doesn't tell the generator how to fool it. It's like, oh yeah, you failed. But I never give you any constructive feedback on why you failed. So this is the same thing for this reward model. I can tell you like, oh, you met, you, met, you met the benchmark for harmlessness or you met the benchmark for safety, uh, for helpfulness. But just this reward signal alone doesn't tell me, oh, how am I going to be more helpful? I'm going to be less helpful. Okay, why do you think it's necessary to do rejection sampling? Okay, 
you sample the best reward model. Okay, because once you sample, you already have the ground truth like that. You can sort of like step towards that ground truth. Okay, if just given this reward score alone, I don't think it's possible for you to learn that well. Okay, so this kind of highlights, you know, like maybe we just need rejection sampling with some form of supervised fine tuning. Maybe we don't need PPO. Okay, but this is my view. All right. So, so, so just to clarify, the term rejection sampling here is, is not the same as the one in the steady states, right? What we normally talk about rejections. Yeah, I don't think so. This is basically like top K, uh, top sampling. I mean, you can treat it as top sampling. You sample K responses, pick the top. Oh, so the best of the best of yeah, best of K. If you look at the yeah, yeah, the is best of K sampling. Yeah, yeah, you are yeah, right. The rejection sampling has another meaning. Yeah, but it's not that meaning here. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at how RRHF work. So earlier on, I said until V seven actually is only until V five. You can see that in terms of helpfulness and harmlessness the RHF method kind of worked well, all right? It uh, made them both helpful, more helpful and more harmless in terms of like, if you look at the reward model score, all right? So a, a bit of bias here because like, there's no good benchmark to rate helpful and uh, harmlessness right now. So they just base it on the score. Uh, helpfulness, they base it on GPT-4 and you can see that um, the helpfulness has also increased. So in terms of the RHF portion, I would say that uh, in terms of the metrics that they want to achieve, it has achieved its aim, all right? But I'm just wondering, okay, I'm just going to put this here open for discussion. Can we just do rejection sampling plus SFT? Yeah, okay, so this is something that um, is open for discussion. Like, do we really need the RHF? So I, I leave it as it is because I don't have the answer for this unless I go and do some experiments on this. All right, so that's the end for Lama 2. Uh, overall, I think Lama 2 is a great model. Okay, it, it's about the same as ChatGPT, less math and code. Uh, it should be easily runnable if you have like a few GPUs, like uh, small models, maybe a single like 3090 can do it. Uh, larger models, maybe you need like two 4090s or two AA100s. So some of the discussion question is like, can we use SFT instead of RHHF? This is what I was mentioning just now. Maybe our HF generalized a bit too much. You can just do supervised fine tuning. And the benefit of this is that the, the signal is denser, the denser reward signal versus a sparse reward signal. Okay. For helpfulness and harmlessness, can it be done with a constitutional AI prompt to filter the response? So um, this will be something like this prompts, and then the model gives a response. And then like you, you give it constitution, earlier prompt and response and ask it to refine the response. So this is something like a reflection. You get, ask the model and then you have a corrected response. So after you do this whole process, can we just take this prompt and the corrected response and we do supervised fine tuning. So this is, my bet, I think it can work. Okay, but uh, sorry, as you said, um, maybe with just a constitution, you cannot get this corrected response. So maybe in this case, may need human annotators. So I just realized, right? Um, actually, the constitution thing is especially designed to tackle the 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 safeguard issue because you can't really put the usefulness in terms of constitution, right? You can unless you just say. It, you must be useful, but what do you, how do you even define useful? It's very different in different contexts. Whereas for safety, you can you can actually make the your constitution more meaningful. Like you cannot be a uh, certain type of content cannot be uh, allowed and stuff like that. But in terms of usefulness, I, I think it's very hard to specify as a set of uh, rules or, uh, or constitution, right? So that's why they start off from a useful RLHF. Not the other. I see. So there must That's be. Why, you you must have a useful model first, then you do the alignment in terms of make it safer. Yeah. I see. I mean, that's that's what has been done right now. Maybe in the future you don't have to do the RHF step, the beginning, but you can just take some data that is already safe and helpful. 
Yeah. So uh, anyway, let's go to the next question. So will RHF improve uh, to make the performance worse? So uh, the thing is, I we don't know because we don't have the data. But I, I suspect it might actually make the some of the outputs worse because maybe some of the question answer data sets uh, might have something that's a little sensitive, like maybe how to make a bomb or something. Then the model might just output, I'm not able to tell you. So you know it gets it wrong because it did not give the answer. So I think it will make some performance worse. Right? But will it make some better? Not sure. So there's no results on this. Uh, so again, RHF is great for limited samples. You want to generalize to a lot more. Okay. Um, but actually, it's not really very little. It's 1 million samples. This is even more than SFT in this case. So I'm not sure of this answer. This is an open uh, area of, of, of investigation. Yeah, we can go and find out more about this. Um, next, I think this answer you can answer. Yeah. How can we improve LAMA for code and math? And any or anyone, anyone has any suggestions? How can we improve LAMA 2 right now? It's not very good at code and math. How do you think we can improve it? Just to make sure I <laughs> uh, make sure of experts <laughs> like like GPT four is it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the most intuitive way. Yeah, so you maybe you have one experts that, that did code and math, but how do you train the expert? You use SFT to train experts on code math. Or I mean, if you don't do make sure of experts, you can just use SFT to train on like code math data sets. But but then I have a concern because now, um, with more uh, capabilities, you might have to scale up your model size, right? Uh, possible. But you know the seventy billion model is quite big already. That's that's really uh in terms when you say it's big or small, the way I think of it is in terms of with respect to the number of tokens you have trained. So if you need a lot of data to train on math and coding tasks, then you might need a lot more data than maybe even 70 billion is not enough. Yeah, indeed. So actually your response made me think of something else. Uh, maybe we can use retrieval augmented generation for like some code samples, some math snippets, and like maybe ground the model to generate better code. That, that may be one way. Yeah, but um, this way is, is not foolproof because um, this only works in distribution or, or very close to this. Yeah, so ideally, we would want the language model to innately already know how to do the code and math problems. So I guess you still have to do some, some form of training. Fine tuning is definitely uh, unavoidable. Yeah, but I, I believe with the open source community. So one good thing about using Lama 2 is that a lot of people will be interested to train it, and there will be a lot of different specialized models for different use cases. I would expect to see Lama 2 hit like 5.1 standards soon, okay, because if you just train on the textbooks data set or the coding textbooks, maybe it already will be quite good at coding. So we, we don't know, but if we use the approaches that are done in 5.1 or textbooks are all you need to fine tune Lama, maybe that will be the solution to solve this. Okay, so I think that's more or less it for today. Uh, sorry, I exceeded quite a bit, <laughs> exceeded by 40 minutes and uh, thanks for staying. Uh, yeah, uh, Sorry, any I, I still have two points to like to. Oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. So, first, um, when you, I, I, I think we need to make it precise. What do you mean by the whether the reverse signal is dense or sparse? So, in terms of comparing SFT and RHF, I think it's fair to say, compare individual reverse signal, SFT is denser because, of course, if given an expert demonstration, it has richer, much richer information compared to just a scalar, right? But if you, you see, if you look at how they are actually trained um, in practice, right, there's no way SFT can have more reward signal uh, than RHF because RHF, uh, we, the premise for RHF is we already have a reward model. Basically, you can think of it as an oracle. So whatever uh, input you give it, if you give you a scalar, to tell you, let's assume the reward signal, the real model is, is trained with good quality, right? Then for whatever input, it will give you a scale. So you can, in principle, have unlimited amount of signal. Whereas for SFT, you, only, you are only confined with the limited number of very good uh, data you created, right? So in that sense, SFT, I, I would say is 
much sparser than uh, RNA okay. share. You are right in the sense of uh, quantity. But again, as with uh, Lima, you know, like, do you want more quality data, which is SFT, versus uh, more quantity, which is RHF? Because yeah. the RHF, I cannot guarantee you the quality is good. That, that brings, brings me to my second point I would like to highlight. So, we, so my understanding is that, uh, so for a very large model, the reason it doesn't overfit to particular training sample is because what we call the it is in the so-called uh, over parameterized regime, right? So if you know the double descent paper yeah. or the relevant result. So my hypothesis is if you have a very large model, large in the sense that the parameter count is much more in terms of uh, compared to the number of token, number of distinct token you have trained on, then this kind of model uh, maybe is less prone to overfit to individual data. So here, by which I mean the SFT expert data. So maybe you, you wouldn't have uh, this overfitting issue I mentioned just now. Because in my own experiment, I've tried on the very the, the rather small one, the 1 billion um, uh, model in, cool. from Hugging Face. It is, it is quite obvious that if I just give it um, expert demonstration, it will overfit because the performance is much worse than RLHF. But it, might, it may not be the the case with when we have a large enough model. Yeah. I think if it overfits based on one example for SFT, it may be because of your learning rate is too high, or it could be that the model itself cannot remember that well. It, it keeps getting overwritten by the latest weights. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't have enough uh, parameters, if you experience this thing called catastrophic forgetting, right? So yeah. you, st you, still, you still need to resort to a larger model. Yeah. Okay, uh, anyone else? Has, uh, thanks, Sari. I think that's very insightful. I think this debate of RHF or not will go on for the next few years. Yeah, but meanwhile, I'm very happy to just use LAMA2 because LAMA2, uh, although it contains certain things that I don't agree with, like rota rotatory and, uh, positional embeddings, uh, usage of RHF, and also the other thing is like they do this ghost attention thing, which I think is a, a bit of a hack for poor attention uh, module. I, I, although they do have this kind of a slight, I would call that like some some unpleasantness for myself. I think overall, in terms of the output perspective, the output has been quite good. And if you have any use cases that can fit within four thousand ninety six context length, and perhaps a little more, like six thousand to eight thousand, might be possible if you extend the rot rotary positional embeddings. You can use Lama too. So I think overall, despite some unpleasantness. Overall, the experience of using Lama 2 has been positive. And I really thank Meta for releasing this to the public because this is a huge thing that can be used for a lot of applications. So yeah, one last moment, if uh, there's anything else you want to add. Yeah, by the way, right, if you really don't like RL, then I would say that you see the problem of fine instruction fine tuning, right? You even formulate it as the MD problem is it's not uh, not necessary to be solved by RL uh, approach because essentially it's a contextual bending problem. There are much more algorithms for this kind of problem. So I think the, the reason that now we are just, everyone is using RHF with PPO is because it has been shown as a it's been shown to work. Case, yeah. right? And it also because OpenAI last time worked on RL problem. So they have very mature uh, technology or infrastructure to use PPO. Then they just apply that to the this problem and it kind of worked. That's why everyone is using it. But in in actual in, in reality, like there's much more uh techniques to to be to, can be used to solve this problem. So yeah, not just RL. Yeah. Then also another point is like unfortunately because of the length of time it takes to train a large language model, it's very hard for people to tinker around with some parameters. So we just take whatever works and build on it. Yeah, so, but I do see like there's a this paper called uh, Alpaca farm like they compare uh a, a, a array of uh instruction tuning method right not just rl but mm -hmm. they claim that from the result ppo is still the best <laughs> yeah they compare uh quite a few different approaches yeah you can have a look yeah that's good so i think at the moment rhf is still necessary because maybe we don't have enough high quality data yet 
yeah, and RHF allows you to like use one train one reward model and then use it on many, many different outputs. So it's like you have a maybe a noisy teacher, but at least you have a teacher. So I can buy that argument. Yeah. yeah. Okay, not uh thanks for coming today and uh, happy playing with Lama too. Uh, let me know how, how it has been. I, I myself gonna download the weight soon or so and, and play around with it. And then I I'll probably have another video to show how to fine-tune it. All right. And now see y'all. Okay, bye everyone.